Well, we're surrounded by Christmas decor. We sang some Christmas songs, but we're going to Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> at least for this morning. So if you've joined me in your Bibles, Romans chapter 1, I'd like to read from verse 8 down through verse 17. Romans 1, beginning verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how I unceasingly make mention of you, always in my prayers, making request, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruitful work among you, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Our Father in heaven, we come before you in humble recognition of our need of you, our need of your instruction, our need of the the message that you have for us even this morning from this passage and all that your spirit would teach us. We're also mindful of our need to grow in Christ and that growth has to come from you. And we recognize that there are many things that have interrupted that growth in our sanctification, our walk of faith with you. We take these moments to confess our unworthiness, our failures, our sins, those things that have been displeasing to you in our lives. And we confess them knowing that you are a faithful God to forgive, to cleanse from all unrighteousness and to keep fresh that fellowship that we have, that the believer has with you through your son, Christ Jesus. How grateful we are that we've been able to enter through the veil that your son has provided, that passage, that entrance into the heavenly kingdom the forgiveness of sins, granting eternal life. Father, we have much to to praise you for and to give thanks for. We do so this morning, and we ask now that you will lead and direct in this message, not only in me speaking it, but in each of us hearing from our God this morning from your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it was two weeks ago we left off in our study of Romans a look at this example, and that's how I see verse 8 to verse 15. Paul is giving to us, giving to the Romans, something of his philosophy and his desires. And whether or not Paul intended this, he is really setting before us an example or a testimony of himself in ministering the gospel. And that's how I want us to see these verses, even as we started two weeks ago looking at a matter of prayer that was instrumental to Paul's gospel ministry. And he set an example for us to follow in our ministering of the gospel. So it's good for us to look at this as a pattern of Paul's testimony, ministering to the church in Rome, but ministering to the churches, the other churches that he had an impact on. We did start a couple of weeks ago looking at that matter of prayer, that that necessity that Paul had to pray and to do so continually. He's throwing his thanksgiving, his gratitude before the Lord for all that God has provided him. He's consistent in telling the churches, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. But he's showing us here as well, this is his practice. He was consistent in his prayers, and he calls us to be consistent in our prayers. He's showing us the example that even in our prayers, we submit to the will of God. And that submission to God's will is going to be the heart of what I'm going to be sharing this morning as we turn our attention from prayer prayer now to a matter of Paul's passion for the gospel ministry. And we see this especially coming out in verse 11 and 12 where he says, For I long, that word long is expressing his desire, his zeal, his passion, just to come to Rome to impart some spiritual gift to them so that they would be established. 
That is, and he goes on in verse 12, that I may encourage together with you, well, among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. There's a lot in those two verses, but Paul is exposing the passion that he had in ministering the gospel. Again, setting an example for us to follow. When he wrote in verse 11 that he longed to see them in person, though in the writing of this letter he recognizes he hadn't been able to be there, he was submitting himself to the cir greater circumstances of his ministry. And if we go to chapter 15, we saw this in our previous study, and you look at verse 20, that greater ministry was that Paul had a lot of other ministerial obligations, other cities, and he was so busy in the ministries there and so important and needful for those ministries that he could not leave and come to Rome. So one of the reasons that Paul is saying, I could not come to you was because I have all these other obligations that have taken up my time. I haven't been able to get to you yet, but my heart's there. I want to come. I long to be with you. That's the passion of Paul. Further, Paul did not want to serve the gospel where other ministers were laboring. So that also directed his path. And this is why he wanted to come to Rome, because he recognized there was no apostolic ministry there in Rome yet. So part of his passion is to go where others had not labored. <clears throat> In the other apostles, the other church leaders, they were serving in a particular city or region. He would let that work go so that he could build up the churches in other areas. He would move on, invest his time and energy where there was no preaching or guidance being accomplished largely by other apostles. So Paul's heart was for the gospel, but he needed to be as efficient as possible. That's the practical side of Paul here. He wants to go where others were not laboring. There's already time and, and, and ministry being invested over here. So he's saying, I want to go over here where there's no leadership. There isn't that guidance. The passion that Paul had for the gospel ministry was first an expression of his love for Jesus Christ, who graciously saved him and placed him into the service for Christ. And we saw that as we started this study in Romans from Acts chapter 9. It was Christ that commissioned him. Paul had a love for Christ. And consequently, Paul had a love for those that God would call to salvation through the preaching of the gospel. This is what impassioned Paul. The love for Christ, the love for the people of God. True gospel passion is therefore not simply one's drive or ambition in the ministry. That's not what we're talking about here with Paul. That's not his passion. It's not a man that was just driven or ambitious in ministry. It was a ministry fueled by love for Christ and a love to see others come to Christ and a love to see others grow in Christ. And from these verses, Paul expresses his longing or his passion. And I'm beginning here with verse 11, his passion to strengthen through spiritual instruction. We're going to look at several parts of Paul's passion. This is where we're going to begin, where he's, he had a passion through the gospel ministry to strengthen through spiritual instruction. Paul wrote of imparting some spiritual gift in verse 11 to the Roman believers for the purpose of establishing them. And that word establish means to confirm them or to steadfastly set them on a course in their Christian walk of faith. In verse 8, Paul had already acknowledged that the Roman believers had experienced a work of faith, a work of faith that was significant enough that it was being talked about throughout the entire Roman Empire. All throughout the Asia Minor area where Paul had ministered, he'd been hearing about the work of faith that God was doing in Rome. But as is true of every Christian ministry, there's always room for more growth of believers. So Paul hoped to come to Rome. He'd heard about the work that was going on there. He wanted to come and build up or strengthen the faith of the believers that God was already accomplishing in Rome. And given that Paul was aware that no apostolic work had yet been done there among the churches, <clears throat> according to Paul's ministerial practice, as stated in chapter 15, he knew that there would be some profit from him going to the churches in Rome. There was a need for work there among the believers. What I think is a bit more curious, though, is that he intended to accomplish this strengthening, this establishing work, by imparting, it says, some spiritual gift to them. Now, that 
that expression, spiritual gift, likely is going to immediately cause us to think about the spiritual gifts that come from the Holy Spirit, Romans 12, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, or Ephesians 4, or uh, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 4. Some of those passage articulated or defined some of the spiritual gifts. I do not believe that's what Paul is referring here. Because those spiritual gifts, remember, are given by the Holy Spirit, not by the Apostle Paul. So Paul is not saying, I'm coming there to give you or to send you a spiritual gift. Rather, I believe this is a reference to his spiritual giftedness that he intended to impart to the believers. The spiritual gift that Paul hoped to bring to Rome for the purpose of steadfastly setting the believers in their walk of faith would have been the same thing that he was doing in the writing of this letter. He couldn't come personally. Instead, he will write this letter. He is, in fact, imparting a spiritual gift to them, even in the writing of this letter. Paul was likely referring to his own ministry to the church that was enabled by the Holy Spirit. What God had given Paul to do, that's what he wanted to come and do in Rome. Consistent with what Paul brought to every town and to every church was the teaching ministry of the inspired revelation from Jesus Christ. And remember, Paul had received the gospel doctrines, not from men, but from Christ himself. And this is what this letter had intended to provide. If he had been able to travel to Rome at that time, This is what he would have done among those believers. He would instruct them on spiritual matters that would strengthen them. That's Paul's passion. And we see it in every one of his letters. His passion to communicate the doctrines and the teaching, the instruction of Jesus Christ. And what I think is so important in this strengthening of a church is quite different than we often see in contemporary methods of church growth. I think when we talk to people about their particular church or what they ask you about your church, oftentimes what we hear talked about, oh, I've got a wonderful church, and then they start listing all the programs and the varied ministries that they have. And we somehow are convinced that if there's a big church with lots of programs and lots of ministries, it must be a healthy, active, vital church. But nowhere do we find the Paul or the apostles building churches on programs or teaching us how to adapt a variety of ministries to meet the expectations of the culture around us. Strengthening the believers will build stronger churches, and this is done through the faithful teaching of the word of Christ, the faithful teaching of God's word. This morning, we're going to be taking communion together, and I forgot to announce that. Um, The communion cups are in the back. We are going to be doing communion, so when when I'm done here and we're singing the next song, you can go back and get a communion cup if you have not done so yet. We're going to take communion this morning. Why is it we're taking communion? Why is that part of the ministry here? Well, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is what Paul said. For I have received, that's which I delivered to you. I have received, Paul, from Christ, that which I'm also delivering to you. That should be the model of every healthy, vibrant church. It should be our motto as well. The New Testament writers received from Jesus Christ. Paul received from Jesus Christ. And he imparted that to us. We have the word of Paul. In reality, it's the word of Christ. Paul received that word. He put it in letters like Romans, the other New Testament writers as well. So we have that spiritual giftedness. They have received from Christ. They've imparted it. We're using it this morning. That's the spiritual giftedness we're looking at. So our greatest, and this is application for us. This is where we want to apply what Paul is showing us by his example. Our greatest passion should be the instruction of the word of Christ to his people. Whether I'm receiving it or I'm administering it, that should be our greatest passion. It should be what drives us. We have received the word of Christ. Do we understand that? Do we see the significance, the power of it? It is not just a matter of me standing up here and saying some wonderful fluffy things, because I'm not generally known for saying fluffy things, but the power here, the power in the Sunday school, the power in the Iwana classroom. In our, in our counseling ministry to one another, is it not the word of Christ? God has spoken to his people. 
As Paul said, I've received from him, I've now delivered it unto you. That should be our motto. And that's what makes a church healthy and vibrant and strong. Now, we have programs here. We have a variety of ministries, but that's not what makes us a strong church, is it? It's the fact that the word of Christ is implemented through those programs and ministries. It's about the word of Christ. And this was true of Paul's ministry, who was not only instructed with the word, but he displayed that word in his own walk of faith. That's why we can look at his life here and say, he set an example for us. He not only taught the doctrines, he was living those doctrines. Paul's passion was to strengthen the church through instruction, and then goes on to write that he longed to be present with the Roman Christians for the mutual encouragement both of the church and for himself as, the, as their inspired teacher. So this brings us to verse 12. His passion was for mutual encouragement for both church and pastor. For both church and pastor. And this is clearly added to Paul's passion for gospel ministry in verse 12. He had a passion for spiritual instruction, but notice where that instruction is going. Paul's just not saying, I'm going to come to Rome and I'm going to show you some amazing things. Rather, he's saying, I'm coming to you to minister to you, but I'm anticipating you ministering to me. Go back to verse 8. He'd already heard God was doing a work of faith. So Paul was not the kind of guy that's simply going to come and show up and say, I've got the goods. I'm going to give it to you. You listen to me. This is a, a mark of humility in his ministry, his gospel ministry. His passion was the spiritual instruction of Christ. But if his passion was truly there, it's not just him giving that instruction. He's receiving it. That's what impassioned Paul, the spiritual instruction that had come to, uh, from Christ. So he adds in verse 12 that he joins himself to their fellowship. That's what he desired to do. I'm going to come, join myself to your fellowship, though he'd not seen these people yet. I've chosen to put this in the context of church and pastor because that's literally what Paul is doing here. He's pastoring, he's shepherding the church in Rome. And he's saying, I want to come to you and do this pastoral work. I'm just making application for us in the church community here. And when I say church and pastor, <clears throat> I want us to go beyond me standing up here pastoring or preaching. I want to see us not only as a church that is ministering, but a church that is receiving that ministry. And it applies to every one of us that are sitting here as believers and part of this church community. It's under this declaration to the Roman Christians, verse 12, informed them that Paul not only came to do a work among them, but he looked for the prophet that they would bring to his own walk of faith. This is the Apostle Paul talking to a church he's never even been to. But he's heard that God is at work in Rome. So he's excited. I want to come to you. I want to be ministered, encouraged, and strengthened by you. Paul exemplifies to us a humility in gospel ministry that recognizes both minister and those ministered to are both in need of spiritual encouragement. Paul's letting these believers know that he longed to come to them so that they could minister to each other. And this reforms our thinking quite a bit, I think. It reforms our thinking. This is where we apply again Paul's example to our lives. Paul needed to receive from them even as he intended to bless them. And if this was true for the Apostle Paul, how much more for each of us here today? I believe it's important that Paul's example of humility be applied not only to myself as a pastor here at Summit Park, but to all of those who are going to faithfully minister the gospel as our Lord has called every believer to do and as he's equipped every believer to serve him. It's not just a matter of me fixing somebody else. Somebody else has to be fixing me too. And without question, we can safely assume that just as Paul had heard of the testimony of the gospel of faith going on in Rome, those Roman believers had also heard about Paul's ministry. Remember, Paul had been in ministry, missionary work for, for close to 25 years now, and word had spread all throughout the Mediterranean area. 
of the Apostle Paul. Some didn't like what they heard about Paul. And oftentimes the Jews were prepared for Paul to come into their city and they tormented him. Others appreciated his work. His passion for the gospel was evident to both, though. His passion for the gospel was evident. And as the churches in Rome gathered for worship, this letter would have been spread around, this letter to the Romans. It would have been spread around to those small gatherings in Rome. And these, this letter would have been read to them. They were hearing what Paul was longing to do. He was longing to come to them and minister among them. But he was also anxious to have those believers minister to him. Imagine how that would have sounded to the Roman believers that were gathering together in those probably home church settings. I, I think about well-known preachers or theologians today. When we go to a conference, we get the big names, right? Right? We get the big people, the spiritual giants, and they come, and they come to fix us. And no doubt these spiritual giants, if we want to call them that, these notable theologians, these, these great pastors or, or professors, they have a great deal to give to us. But do we ever think in terms of what we need to give to them? And do they present themselves that way? Verse 11 expressed Paul's passion to do a gospel work among those people to be sure, but then verse 12 adds a clarification that they, the Roman believers, did not likely expect. He's saying, I need encouragement too. I need to be strengthened and built up in my walk of faith as well. That's not a false sense of humility on Paul's part. It is an honest confession of his need to be strengthened and encouraged. And this further emphasizes Paul's true passion for spiritual instruction. It was in the power of the gospel. It's the effectiveness of the spirit of Christ to work through the individual believer for the benefit of others. And that's how we should see ourselves. It should be how we view other believers that are sitting right next to us. It's the power of God's word. And the effectiveness of the Spirit to minister that word through a human vessel to us. And this would be how Paul approached every church that he ministered to. Not just Rome. Ephesus. Philippi. The Galatian churches. Everywhere Paul went, he went there to minister with spiritual instruction. But to be encouraged and strengthened himself. The work of the gospel, you can imagine, would have drained that man. He was not a superman. He was not a superhuman gospel preacher. He was a common, ordinary man. And look at everything that Paul had done for 25 years. Do you think he ever got drained emotionally and spiritually? We have actually testimonies from Paul. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11, Paul goes down an inventory of physical torments and things that he had to endure, shipwrecks and beatings and, and sometimes going hungry, robbers on the road. He experienced all of this sort of stuff. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, he said, Apart from such external things, there are the daily pressures of me Concern for all of the churches. He carried the emotional and spiritual weight of the ministries of the churches and the believers there. Who is weak, he writes, without me being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? That's what it's like to carry each other's burdens. Do you think it drained him? Oh, it most certainly drained him. What Paul is communicating to the church in Rome, I'm coming there hoping you can encourage and strengthen me too, because I need it. This is not false humility. This is an honest expression of a man that knew what he needed from Christ. So he is telling the church, I'm not Superman. He entered the church in any given community. He would fulfill his calling to minister the gospel, but he needed also to be strengthened and encouraged as well. For Paul... Not an expression of false humility, but it's a spiritual reality for him. And I think it's important to see, for us especially, Paul is an amazing character in the New Testament. But he's not the complete package. I'm not the complete package. None of you are the complete package. We need each other. Yet often I think we act like we are the complete package. We know we're not. We're not. 
but I think times we do act as if we are. We don't put ourselves spiritually dependent on one another that easily. Some of you do it well because you recognize, I do need help. But oftentimes we can pull back when we've got problems or struggles. We want to fix it ourselves. We don't want people to know about it. What we've effectively done is we've cut out the work of the Holy Spirit that has been put in other believers for the very purpose of this mutual encouragement and strengthening. Paul is showing us an example of what church pastor, church minister relationship should look like. And this brings me to the obvious in verse 12, the need of others to strengthen and encourage. Paul is not only telling the church, I need to be strengthened and encouraged. He's saying, I need others. I need you people to do that for me. If it was true that the Apostle Paul needed strengthening and encouragement, then his humble confession was that he also needed other believers around him to minister the gospel to him. Notice how Paul makes this personal in verse 12. If you're a person that likes to underline, I'd encourage you to do so. Look at those words that he uses. Encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Do you get the obvious point that Paul is making? He's telling these Roman believers, I need other Christians. I need you folks. It's not like I would like to have it. It would be nice if you helped me. I need you is what he's saying. I need others. We need each other. This is what we often call the communion of the saints. What Paul was confessing to these believers is is that he needed them ever bit as much as they needed him. Paul was far more gifted in instruction since he came with the direct revelation of Christ. And the church needed that instruction. But just as great a need is what the Spirit of Jesus Christ had equipped the Roman Christians with that they could bless him also. Now, the obvious truth, and again, we need to apply these things to our own walk of faith and our communal walk of faith. The obvious truth that Paul models in his own passion for the gospel ministry is that he needed others as much as those that he ministered to. His passion for the gospel ministry was truly mutual. And if Paul needed the gospel ministry to be strengthened and encouraged in his own walk of faith, then he needed other believers to do it. He needed other Christians. He needed the church and the regular fellowship of the saints that would supply that need. And if that's true for Paul, guess what? It's true for us too. What what may be lacking, I think, in us is the same passion that Paul had for the ministry of the gospel to be mutually given and received. Paul, in these verses, models his devotion and his dependence on prayer. But he also models his passion for the ministry of the gospel, both to himself and to the church. And finally, he models his obligation. As we move now into verse 13 to 15, he models his obligation to fulfill the purpose that God had ordained for him, as stated in verse 13, 14, and 15. So we've looked at prayer, how he models prayer. We've looked at his passion and how he models that for both church and minister. But he goes in verse 13 to further present to us a matter of the purpose that God had put him on the planet earth. In these verses, Paul informs his brethren in Rome that he'd very often set plans to come to them, but he had been prevented from coming to this point in the writing of this letter. His heart for the people of God is clearly evident once again, as he regards these believers as part of his spiritual family, he refers to them to breth- as brethren again. He did so back in verse 8. They were beloved. In verse 7, all the beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. He thanks God for them in verse 8. And here in verse 13, brethren. He's recognizing these believers he had never met as his own family in the Lord. The example that Paul shows us in gospel ministry in this passage is an obligation to fulfill the purpose that God had called him to in regard to those that God had put into the family of God. 
the brethren, those that God had adopted. He has an obligation to these ones. And this counters several misconceptions on our part when God ordains a ministry calling for every believer, for every believer, as the scripture says God does, we can often assume that when God gives us a calling or a purpose, it is seen as an option. Honestly, it is. We may not call it an option, but very often we treat it as an option. We may see it as an option based on whether or not we want to do it. We might see it as an option based on whether or not we've arranged our lives to have the time to accomplish that calling or that purpose. We may see it as an option whether, whether or not we may think we have the capability. And I know I've been guilty of this one in the past. Because I can tend to think I'm not capable, so I can't do it, so I shouldn't do it. Or we may assume it's an option because it's too costly in some way. Or there may be another reason that we've excused ourselves from fulfilling our purpose for the kingdom of God here. What I think is interesting, and this should be challenging to us, is that if we have a job and our employer asks us to do something, we generally will do it because we want the paycheck. But if the God of heaven calls us to a ministry work, he may or may not get a response from us. This was not true of Paul. And therefore, again, he is setting before us an example that we should want to follow. We should be encouraged to follow. When Jesus called him to faith and to serve him as the apostle to the Gentiles, as we've already studied, Paul was obligated to Jesus Christ to carry out the purpose that heaven had assigned to him. Once again, his words to the church in Rome set a testimony for us to follow, an example for the people of God here. Paul was first obligated, and I want you to notice this from our text. There are three points I want to make here. Paul was first obligated to be useful, but not essential. To be useful, but not essential. A few weeks back, we looked at a few of the reasons that Paul may have been prevented from going to Rome as a minister of the gospel, though he had planned to do so. Many times he had made plans. We see in verse 10, many times he'd prayed to God, let me go to Rome, arrange my life so I can go to Rome. In chapter 15, his ministry obligations elsewhere kept him from fulfilling those plans. We looked in Acts chapter 16 previously, and we see that the Holy Spirit had restricted Paul's missionary movements. So the Spirit of God could have been active at work here. But what passages like this teach us is that the Lord God sovereignly oversees the ministry of his people. God was carefully plotting the course for Paul. Paul does not tell us why God did not want Paul in Rome at that time. All we can assume from chapter 15, he was busy elsewhere and God wanted him busy elsewhere. But this takes us back to the prayer request that Paul repeated again and again in verse 10 before God. This is what I want to do. Send me to Rome. I've been many times praying. He's telling the Romans this many times. Again and again, I'm going to prayer. God, send me to those people. I long to do a ministry, a spiritual instruction ministry with them. Paul submitted, however, to the will of God, and the will of God determined Paul's course. Paul continued the gospel work where the Lord permitted him to serve, and he did so to fulfill the calling of the Lord. He ministered elsewhere. He fulfilled his calling. And in this case, God fulfilled his purpose in a way that Paul did not ask for. Paul's own testimony, verse 8, there was a work of faith taking place in Rome, and guess what? Without Paul, without any of the apostolic representation. So confident was Paul on the growth of the church in Rome that Paul was willing to go to Rome and have those people minister to him because of what he said in verse 8. He knew God was doing a work of faith there. He was so confident in God's work, he was willing to go to Rome and let those people minister to him. So Paul is saying, I know God is at work there. But he's also saying, God's doing it without me. I'm going to be useful to Christ, but I'm not essential. 
And the reality is the same is true. We apply this to any one of us. God told Paul no. God made Paul useful to the church in another way. But God does not need Paul. He does not need any of us. We are not essential. God needs nothing. And Paul's testimony, example for us here, is that we can be and should be useful to the Lord, but none of us are essential to the gospel work. The truth is, God doesn't need any of us. If he wants to fulfill a purpose, he can do it completely without us. And this is an important lesson. This is, again, important application for us in the ministry. We can pray. We can set our plans. We can even be useful to the Lord God, but none of us are needed to make any ministry a success. I know that about myself. And yet at the same time, if things are going to get done, I put a lot of pressure on myself to get it done. And you probably do the same thing. And the reality is I'm not needed. Summit Park's going to continue with or without Mont. And it's going to continue the work here without any of you. God is privileging us with the obligation to serve him and be useful to his kingdom. But we're not essential. Did Paul, was he thinking that when he wrote this here to the Romans? I don't know. But it's clearly there. The example that he's giving to us is clearly there. He prayed, he set plans, God said no. But yet the work continued in Rome, and it continued without Paul. Was Paul useful to Rome? Absolutely, he wrote this letter. But was Paul thinking, I'm just not needed there? I don't know. But was that Paul's doctrine? Yes, he absolutely understood this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In the church of Corinth... There were problems going on, one of which was divisions that were taking place within the church. Some were saying, I like the work that Apollos is doing. I'm going to be on team Apollos. Others were saying, no, no, Paul's the, the apostle to the Gentiles. I'm going with team Paul. This is what Paul had to say about that. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? We are only servants through whom you've believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. In other words, it's the Lord that has done this. We're just servants. He goes on to say, I planted, Apollos watered, we each had our work, but God was causing what? The growth. God did the success. The success was him. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. How's that for a ministry commendation? I'm nothing. But it's God that causes the growth because he chooses to use us. We are useful, not essential. The point here is that God is pleased to use human vessels in a work that he could do far better by himself. But none of us are essential, not even the apostles, not even Paul. God is able to do his work without us Though he chooses very often to make us youthful when he's ministry. We pray. We don't get what we request. Perhaps he's reminding us of who God is and who God is not. I'm not God. I'm not essential. But we know who is. God is essential. Along with the same truth, Paul also anticipated a fruit-bearing work among the believers by coming to them in person and spending some time with them. He names that fruit in verse 13. My hope was, my longing was to come and obtain some fruit among you also, even, if, even as I've done among the rest of the Gentiles. That's been my pattern. It's, it's been my history. It's been my ministry. I want to bear fruit. However, God intended the fruitfulness to come differently than Paul had prayed for, than Paul had longed for. In writing a letter, this letter to the church in Rome, this instruction, and the application of it, largely it would have been administered by the pastors and the church leaders in Rome. Do you realize what God has done here? 
He said, Paul, I don't want you to go. I want you to write a letter. The letter is written. It's sent off to the churches in Rome. It's circulated around the, the, the home church groups there in Rome. Who's going to administer that instruction? Who's going to cause the practical application and the oversight? It's not Paul. It's going to be somebody else. Somebody else is going to bear that fruit. Paul prays that he might do a work of ministry in Rome. And the Lord says, no, Paul, I want you to write a letter instead and let others bear fruit from your writing. Now, when you think about what Paul might have done when he came to Rome, given the content and the importance of Roman and doctrines in Romans, I can anticipate Paul would have spent three, four years there teaching these instructions, showing application. When I brought a, an example, this is a, one of the commentaries on Romans, one of the many on Romans. Look what is written here. This is what Paul would have done had he been personally in Rome. He would have spent time instructing, applying, showing the application and how it's practiced in different nuances, in different settings. That's what Paul did when he went to the cities. He spent several years in Ephesus. He spent time in Corinth. If he'd gone to Rome, he would have done more than just speak a 16-chapter letter here. In writing this letter, it would have been a very, very brief account of the work that he actually would have done in person. My point is that Paul didn't bear the fruit of it. Somebody else took that letter. Other church leaders and pastors, they, they implemented this instruction in the believers there in Rome. Paul wanted to bear fruit. God said, I have another way for you, Paul. I have another use for you. And in this way, though Paul wanted to obtain some fruit himself in Rome, others would have had to do so. Paul had to face the reality that his physical presence in Rome was not essential. He also had to accept that the Lord would equip and use others to obtain the fruit that Paul had hoped to yield for Christ. But it didn't change Paul's purpose. It didn't change his passion. He was okay with this. In truth, we continue to do the same thing today with the letters that Paul and others had written some 2,000 years ago. We're doing the same thing. We're taking the work of Paul that he sent to Rome, and it's now here in Anacortes ministering to us as well as the other New Testament letters and writers. Today we teach, we preach, we counsel, we disciple, we instruct. We even correct believers with the writings of Paul and Peter and John and Luke and others. And it's by those past ministries that we obtain, we obtain some fruit in the people that we're ministering to with the revelation of Christ that came through these men. A lesson for the church today as we apply this is that God may tell us no because he has other ministers in mind to accomplish our plans and our passions. He intends to bear fruit through others, even in how God used us. And in addition to this, an important point to observe from these verses is that where Paul writes of obtaining some fruit in his gospel ministry, it is not in any way limited to evangelism. Or evangelistic endeavors. Paul did preach calling sinners to repentance and faith in Christ. Very much was he an evangelist. But most of the gospel ministry that Paul is describing in these verses is to people that are already believers. And notice the language that is used. Verse 15. I'm coming to you to what? Preach the gospel. When we think of preaching the gospel, what do we think of? Oh, we think of going out into the world of unsaved people, preaching the gospel so they get saved. Paul is saying, I'm coming to Christians in the church, and I'm preaching the gospel. That's how he viewed this ministry. Most of the gospel ministry that Paul addresses here is the strengthening and encouragement of those who are already believers. So this passage is largely about discipleship. And the fruit that he hoped to see in Rome, while it would have included calling sinners to faith in Christ, it was largely a gospel fruit of seeing believers nurtured and strengthened in their faith. That's the fruit that's being described here. Paul's obligation to fulfill his gospel purpose was to accept that he would be used by the Lord, but was not essential to the gospel work. He would use, be used by Christ, but Christ may bear fruit fruit 
by other hands. Christ will determine how he's going to bear the fruit. And second, Paul was obligated not only to recognize he was useful, but not essential. Secondly, in verse 15, Paul was obligated to go where he was sent, but to all people. Now, that may not make sense at first, but Paul was sent somewhere, but he was sent to all people. He was sent as the apostle to the Gentiles. But notice his obligation here in verse 14. I am under obligation, both the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. We observe in verse 13 that he was fulfilling his calling to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why he's coming to Rome. He's saying that largely in Rome, the congregations there are mostly made up of um, Gentiles. We recognize there were Jews present there because much of the content of Romans is dealing with Jewish matters. But verse 13 lets us know there's a large percentage of Gentiles among these believers. That's exactly who Christ sent Paul to minister to. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. But if we go back to Acts chapter 9, the actual instruction that Jesus gave to Paul through Ananias was that you are to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. What Paul is saying here is, I've been sent to minister to the Gentiles, but I'm preaching to everybody. Without distinction, he was obligated to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ without regard to social distinctions, whether Jew or Gentile. I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to the barbarians. And this is, uh, when I think of a barbarian, what do you think of? Somebody that's drooling, can hardly think, carrying a club around, some savage... That's not the Greek society view of a barbarian, apparently. A barbarian is from a word that speaks of babbling. And it's, for the Greeks, it's somebody that came into their, their society or their community that spoke another language. That's all they're talking about to the Greeks, but those that spoke other languages. The limitlessness of his obligation extended beyond the social. It it extended beyond the ethnic. It, It also extended beyond the intellectual. Notice what he says there, to the wise and to the foolish. Whether the wise or the foolish, educated or without, he's going to proclaim the name of Christ. He's going to strengthen and encourage those in their walk of faith. And how refreshing that must have sounded to the Roman believers there in the cities, or in the city, in the churches in the city. Paul was not going to invest himself more fully in those with degrees or higher education. He would not ignore those who were considered ignorant by the lofty philosophical standards of the Greek culture. The Lord had told him to take the good message, the gospel, to all men, and he took this obligation seriously. And again, we apply this to us at the opening of our worship service this morning. We heard that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth from chapter 1 that God has not chosen for salvation those who are wise or mighty or noble from among men because God wanted to show that the power of the gospel is for all. It's not just the smart people that figure out Jesus Christ. Instead, God predominantly goes to the foolish to show just the opposite. I'm the one, God says, that must open the heart. I'm the one that must cultivate faith and repentance. I'm the one that must regenerate. And I will choose whom I'm going to do that to. But God did not exclude either. He doesn't exclude the smart guy. He doesn't exclude the Greek or the Jew. Instead, God brings many of these to faith to show that salvation is a work of God and not of man's intellectual or ethnic distinctions. Therefore, that's going to be our calling. It doesn't matter who's out there that doesn't have Christ. We preach the gospel. And therefore, this would be what Paul obligated his ministry to do. I'm going to all men. Second, verse 15. Actually, it's third. Paul was obligated to do his part, but he's going to do it eagerly. He was obligated to do his part, but he was going to do it eagerly. Here in verse 15, he does not mention what was included in the obligation to minister when he writes 
doing his part? What would his part have been? Elsewhere, Paul is not at all shy to tell us that the churches that he ministered to, it was hard work. It required great sacrifice. It demanded commitment and time. And it promised to bring much suffering. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus told Paul he must do. I'm going to show that man how much he must suffer for me. Yet Paul is saying here to the church, I'm eager to do my part. His part was to suffer. His part was to make huge commitments of time and work. And we've seen that in our past study of Paul writing this letter. But he's eager to do his part because the gospel had such a broad reach on humanity as he just described in verse 14. The ministry is his passion. It was also his desire to be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've often heard it said that we should not look at ministry as a duty, but a privilege. I've heard others object to our referring to our calling as a job or even an occupation. We shouldn't call it a job. We shouldn't call it an op- occupation. And apparently such references to the gospel, referring it to some kind of duty, devalues the privilege that we're given to the ministry of the gospel. I think Paul is clearly telling us it's both. It is both an occupation and a privilege. It is both a duty and an obligation, but I am eager to do it. I'm doing it with joy. I want to. I'm impassioned with this. And this, again, is an application for us. This is what you should do. That's an obligation. But at the same time, Paul was eager to fulfill this obligation because this was the pleasure of the Lord God. And Paul knew that God's pleasure is always right and good. And if it pleased God, it pleased Paul. And if it pleases God, it should please us also to fulfill that which God has ordained for us. Paul just finished letting the church in Rome know that he was under obligation to do a gospel work among them. And I would not hesitate to say that this was the job that God had given him to do. It truly was an occupation. I have no problem telling people that my pastoring is an occupation. It occupies my time. It's where I get a paycheck. I understand that. But it is the duty, it is the obligation that God has given to me like he's given to every believer a calling. We should be obligated to fulfill that calling. And knowing who we're doing that for should cause us at the same time to be eager to do it. Look at who we're obligated to. The Son of God and what he's done for us. So Paul says, for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also. This is a gospel that goes everywhere without limits. It saves without limits. The Greek, the Jew, the barbarian... The wise, the foolish, I'm eager to do that. For God was at work saving and sanctifying sinners. Paul wanted to be at work as well. And again, we see the undertones of Paul's evangelism, his evangelistic heart to save or to bring to salvation those who were without Christ. But verse 15 most certainly tells us that Paul felt obligated to do a gospel work among those who are already believers there in Rome, regardless of their ethnicity, their social standing, their intellectual abilities. He wanted to strengthen and encourage believers in Christ. That was his passion. That was his purpose in life. And he was eager to fulfill it. Paul is setting a marvelous example for us in ministering the gospel in just these opening words, verse 8 to verse 15. Father, I pray that you would take these words, take the testimony of this man, and apply it to our hearts and our ministry as well. Fill us with a great desire to be impassioned with ministry, to fulfill our purpose, but Father, to bathe that ministry, any ministry you're involved in, in prayer humbling ourselves before you, that you would accomplish the work the way you want it done and through whom you want it done. Cause us to have the mindset that we can be useful to you, though we are not essential, that we can cause some fruit, though through our hand, the work of our hands, you may want to bring fruit through somebody else. And Father, cause us to be humble enough to say, I not only need spiritual instruction, I need to give it. There needs to be that mutual communion of the saints.
teach us these things in our ministry together here at Summit Park. We pray in Christ's name.